Hello and welcome to tonight's book reading session of Preparing for the Day After, a picture ebook. Preparing for the Day After is a photojournalistic treatise on disaster mitigation published by me, Malini Shankar, and Walter Keller for the 10th anniversary of the Asian tsunami. Tonight we will meet more survivors of the Asian tsunami and read their first person narrative of a chilling first person account from of their near death experience, but from many more locales. Today I will read out part 3 of chapter 9 and it concludes this week. Tonight we will meet some amazing, we will see some amazing pictures in spectacular locales, believe me. But let us first recap what we have learned in the previous book reading session before we start tonight's session. Water and sanitation is central to developmental discourse. Livelihoods based on local agrometeorological conditions are the best means of ensuring livelihood security. Culture sensitive food security also has evolved out of local agrometeorological conditions prevalent in an area. Climate change adaptation, menstrual hygiene, especially for indigenous tribal women, solid waste management, universal healthcare access, sustainable development goals, they are all factors to be included in the developmental agenda. Media personnel have to be trained in disaster preparedness reporting or the lack of disaster preparedness at district level. Disaster is the impact of a calamity on the human landscape. This also includes the impact on lives, livelihoods, livestock and landscape. Now let me start with Joseph Knauer, my colleague, a filmmaker from Austria who escaped the Asian tsunami from Kaolanta in Thailand. In his own words, we shared the Christmas party with people from Germany, India, Japan and Thailand in a little bungalow resort called BB's Bungalow, which has about 10 little bamboo bungalows. We had packed all our belongings as we wanted to leave the island on that day. Uh, then we had breakfast on the beach. We were sitting in the breakfast table when somebody shouted, look, look how beautiful it is. Then we saw that the sea was gone and a really beautiful silver line was very slowly growing on the horizon. The, the wave came in very slowly and without breaking or destroying anything. After the first wave, a fisherman went out to save his boat. He wasn't really able to swim and the second and the stronger wave came, up, came when he was out there. Another tourist and I rescued him. Another large boat that was tied up when, uh, further out was torn of its anchor and was drifting across the reef towards the beach. This was the moment when we knew that something was wrong indeed. People still were taking videos from the strange behavior of the sea and the owner of the bungalows received a call from his cousin in Kopipi and shouted, get off the beach guys, there might be big waves coming in. He told us of the Kopipi disaster that had already happened. As we had packed all our gear, it was easy for us to grab our things and run further into the island. We knew that there was something wrong. Uh, I left my wife and kids in a safe place with our luggage. I knew that something was something strange was going on and was very aware of myself. I knew I had to run for my life, uh, help or bring my family into safer areas. But for the first moment, we stayed on the beach. When the first big wave arose and rushed towards the beach, I immediately knew that this is a matter of life and death. We didn't have a nightmare, no. There were some moments of uncertainty, like what is going on here, how will it, how long will it all take, uh, what happened to Sid and Sabina. The worst moment for me was when we came back to Bangkok. On a fence at the entrance to the Khao San Road, there were infinite number of pieces of paper. Uh, people were looking for their loved ones. I knew it, it could have been me, my wife or my children who were looking for the rest of the family. We were surprised with the network our friends and families had built up to share information about us, our status. I did not see any documentaries or books. Uh, life went on. We were lucky and never made a big thing about it, you know, Malini. We used our popularity after the event and raised some money that we have donated to an Austrian filmmaker who rebuilt the whole Indian village on the east coast of India and the other half we donated to Anne and Kauru and their neighbors and relatives. That was Yosef Kawa's uh, uh, narrator. Now we meet Barnabas Manju. He, 
He lives at the 47th kilometer settlement in Pulo Bay, Campbell Bay, Great Nicobar Island, which is the last island in Indian territory. It is the southernmost territory in Indian, uh, as Indian continent or subcontinent. It's India's territory. He says, I had never felt such a powerful earthquake before. I had never felt something so powerful. That's Barnabas Manju. We had never felt something so powerful and had never thought that as a consequence of it, a tsunami would be triggered. I had never heard of a tsunami either. Elders always said that in case of a big earthquake, run to clear grounds where there are no trees that will fall on you. So we all instinctively heard it towards the shore. The waves started coming in soon thereafter and lasted a good eight hours. First, we noticed the sea receded very strangely. Uh, the first wave was not so ferocious and so we could save ourselves. So we ran to higher grounds to save ourselves. No, it was not any traditional wisdom, madam, to run to hilly areas. It was done as a reaction, logically. Every succeeding wave was more powerful than the previous one. I cannot say what was the time difference between each wave as we were stressed up to save our belongings. I was in Kondul to celebrate Christmas. My family was here in Campbell Bay, in Pulo Bay, in Great Nicobar Island. My wife, my two sons were washed away in the tsunami. I was 30 years old in 2004. I had gone with my daughter to celebrate Christmas to my native Kondul Island, which is a small island to the north of Great Nicobar Island. But I lost my wife and two sons because they were staying back in Pulo Bay. The government sent a speed boat on the 29th to Kondul to fetch the survivors like me. But I came to Pulo Bay by speed, uh, by speed boat. I could not even cut, recover the bo bodies of my wife or sons. I did not even know that my wife and kids had died in the tsunami. During the days immediately after the tsunami, I was obviously thinking a great deal about them. After discovering about the death of my wife and kids, obviously it struck me very hard emotionally. The government set up a relief center in Campbell Bay where we were, myself and my daughter, we were brought here by the administration. 35 families were brought from Kondul to the relief center. The high speed boat was not enough, big enough to rescue all of us. 35 families were stuck in Kondul with a population of about 172 people. So the men folk opted to swim with life jackets till the adjacent Campbell Bay, which is quite nearby, uh, uh, nearby to Great Nicobar Island. And the women and senior citizens were sent on the speed boat to Pulo Bay in Campbell Bay. Now we we'll meet a lady by name. S. Vallaravalli of the Akare Pettai village in Nagapatnam district in Tamil Nadu. She says, I was 25 years old in 2004. I, uh, one hour before the tsunami, it became cloudy, was becoming dark, animals were behaving strangely. It became so bad that bats started, so dark that bats started to fly. We felt mild quake two hours before the tsunami, yes. Water was boiling hot and upwelling in the ponds and the wells were noticed by some of us women around Akare Petai. The sea water was so dark that they thought it was black smoke. Only when it reached the shore did we realize that the water was black in color. Manohar, president of the traditional panchayat in Akare Petai village. Akare Manohar says, I, uh, I, he was 33 years old in 2004. We did not know about the tsunami. We had never heard of it or its symptoms or its triggers, etc. 426 people died in the tsunami in Akare Petai. At the time of the tsunami, the guy in the white shirt and the black pant, he is Manohar, the one on the right here. Uh, at the time of the tsunami, I was the, in the village, not near the sea, but I was in Nagapatnam. When I heard that the sea was invading land, I came rushing to the village and saw many dead bodies floating. Some were scattered next to the roads. I was in the village with 10 minutes of the, within 10 minutes of the first wave. Akare Petai is like an island because on one side we have the sea and on the other side there is the Kaveri River Delta. The boats that were on the sea had been washed to the river on the roadside. 500 boats were damaged and scattered around here. Everyone was saying, look at the sound of the waves, look at its speed. In Akare Petai Panchayat, including four villages, around, four, around 1,000 people died in four villages in this Panchayat. It was peak fish landing hours. The waves that came at that speed also retreated at tremendous speed. The waves were sucking everything from land to the sea. 
The third wave was not so fast in speed. I heard from others that there had been upwellings in the ponds and the wells. The water was dark blue or black. Sand was mixed with seawater. Those who survived were taken to Tanjore, Thiruvavur and Sikkal and nearby places further inland. After two days only did they come back to settle into shelters. Now we shall meet Vadani, 18 years in 2004 in Thirir Kupam village, Akare Petai, Nagapat Nagapatnam district. Vadani drowned and survived. I was with my parents at home but the force of the waves uprooted us and took us to the sea. My mother died in the tsunami. I drowned and lost consciousness, cannot recall mineral presence in the water madam. I was hospitalized. I survived the battering and limped to shore, barely alive, barely conscious. Then I was taken to the hospital by the medical team. I went with my grandmother to the nearby temple and there was a medical camp where I got first aid. So traumatized, I tell you I cannot recall mineral presence but I had septic wounds for one full month. A worm had infested my forehead and left a deep wound, she says. Now we meet R. Shanmugam, a lighthouse in at, charge at Vodarevu, Ministry of Shipping, Vishakapatnam, Andhra Pradesh. Lighthouse in charge, R. Shanmugam, routinely went to the Sunday market, but on 26th, 26th of December 2004, Sunday, he went to buy vegetables also for his home. He finished his vegetable shopping at around 8.45 and packed his bags. He did not quite notice why at 7, 8.45 a.m. the sky was so cloudy, almost like twilight. It was not raining either. Uh, packing his bags, he walked towards the bus terminus to get home. He suddenly felt sea spray on his face. Mm, strange, he thought. So far away from the coast, no cyclonic weather, why should there be sea spray so far inland? As a lighthouse staffer, he is very used to sea spray at all hours. <coughs> so he just wiped his face and walked towards the bus, not giving it too much importance. There were many people around the bus. This alarmed him again. Speaking at the driver, he realized that the driver was refused to go to, on the road to Vodar Revu because of flooding from the sea. The conductor too was backing the driver, but many people jostled, pressing on the driver to drop them to the nearest point where there is no flooding. Shanmugam too boarded the bus. So the driver reluctantly started driving towards Vodar Revu. As they were driving in towards Vodar Revu, the passengers noticed that people had all come out of their dwellings and were standing on the roadside with their pride possessions with them. Nevertheless, they had anxiety writ large on their face, crying desperately as if the world was coming to an end. Shanmugam found this even more strange and started feeling anxious. It was almost as dark as nightfall by then. Could this be the manifestation of climate change, he wondered. As he came home, he noticed that the neighborhood was being flooded by, from the sea. I saw cops were evacuating people. That was when I knew that something was terribly wrong here. Water spray from the sea and bubbles were lashing out towards the coast. I saw the sea water rising more than the normal level and got really scared. I felt like only my family and I have to watch out for the world that may be sinking. I did not know what was happening. The whole thing was a nightmare. Apart from myself, there were five lighthouse staff. I instructed them to keep their essential belongings with them in a briefcase in case we have to run to safety. I also asked them to keep doors, windows and gates open. One wave crawled inland slowly and then retreated. A second wave too crawled in a tad more ferocious and faster. A third wave also lashed out but it marched in rather slowly. The waves withdrew far offshore, much more than normal during low tide. But since people had been evacuated after news from Tamil Nadu had trickled in, there were no casualties or mortalities in this part of Andhra Pradesh. Obviously, I was so tensed up that I could not sleep a wink that night. But unfortunately, nothing happened in Vishakhapatnam. Now we meet Anasuya Ra Ravi Chandran of the Sneha Fisher Women's Collective in Karaikal Medu, Karaikal Puducherry, who was 22 years when the tsunami struck. The, that day she woke up late and was attempting to feed her 1.5 year old son Idlis for breakfast. She was gazing at the sea from her fisher folk village. Suddenly she noticed that the sea had turned up to become a black sea wall. It was higher than the Pamira trees on the horizon. Many children came running into her house as the door was open. Suddenly there seemed to be a plane in their midst. Such was the deafening roar from the sea. The sunlight was completely blocked. It became dark as if daylight turned to night. The sea seemed to churn the beach sand angrily. 
the water inside the house started swirling like a whirlpool. One of the children got entangled in the roof as the swelling water lifted up the child. I was swept away by the water. I found myself at sea. I lost consciousness. At some point, the water deposited me on the road. I was mistaken for dead and abandoned. I think I lost consciousness because I was slammed by hot water infested, infested with heaven knows what chemicals or minerals they were there. After gaining consciousness, like other survivors, I too found myself frothing and foaming. It took a week for me to recover. My face and limbs were swollen. Three children in my hut died except the one who was swept to the roof. Now we go to meet Rajendran of Fisherman's Collective in Karaikal Medu, Karaikal Pondicherry. I had just landed the day's fish catch. There were at least 500 people who had just finished mass at the Pelangani church and were purchasing fish. Someone called out saying the sea was looking very strange. All of us turned to look at the sea. The sea was frothing and fuming menacingly, but far out at the horizon. It seemed to be coming to the coast rather slowly. Then gradually, boats that were tied in anchor were found floating on the sea. Then all of a sudden, the sea rose sky high. I found a fishing boat tossed to the beach in front of me. Next moment, I was inundated in the sea water. Eventually, the water deposited me in front of the post office. I got all caked up in sand. The thatched roofed hutments of the fisher folk next to the post office were swirling in the sea water. I ran up to the terrace of the post office and started rescuing people who were being tossed by the sea. Whoever was within my reach, I rescued. Susain Minj, a caretaker. Susain Minj, a caretaker at the National Institute of Ocean Technology Guest House in Dolliganj, Port Blair, says. Madam, I was in Diglipur in my sister's house for two months. Uh, when the tsunami struck. We felt the first tremor at 6.35 a.m. I think. I was preparing to peel coconuts to make sweets for that day. Adjacent to my sister's house are agricultural fields and on the other side there are tall palm trees. At the first jolt itself, the trees lunged forward at a 90 degrees angle. It was such a sharp jolt, I thought this was the end of the world. It was the first time in my life that I felt such a powerful quake. I thought I was, I, this was just before death. The Bengalis of the area believe that the earth needs to be pacified with a strange rolling of the tongue. The earth cracked, the bridge between Mayabandar and Diglipur was damaged, roads were damaged, water supply cut off, power supply was snapped, mobile networks had snapped, only police wireless networks were working. I was very worried if I would ever see my beloved father again. There was a rumor which gained ground that another tsunami will hit after three days. So you can imagine our state of anxiety. After three days, I had managed to board a bus to Middle Andaman, my native place. The place seemed to be like a war zone with people on the roadside staring at the horizon in horror. Some were pleading for the bus driver to stop to rescue them. Everyone was holding their possessions and desperately trying to flee for safety. When the bus stopped in Rangat Bazar, it seemed like humanity had abandoned civilization. It was deserted with cops lining the place, uh, defending the destruction only. I changed the bus to reach home and when I reached home, I realized that my house was intact without damage. My family was so safe, so I was greatly relieved. The tsunami smashed the Nala drive, uh, drive and destroyed the mangroves because the earth had heaven up. And when tsunami came, the bio shields were destroyed. But after destruction of the mango, mangroves, not because of the tsunami, but because the earth heaved up, a fresh new jungle has come up. I went back to Diglipur two months later. Now I'll again have to stop this because that's Parmeshwaran. I went home two months later only to see that people were still petrified of the earthquake and the aftershock. People were living outside their homes while they were doing everything outside the built up area, including cooking. The long-term impact in Middle Andamans is that the groundwater has become saline. But since our homes 
and livelihoods were not affected we did not need livelihood subsidies etc well water has dried up everywhere creeks are drained ground water ha- table has dried up water channels got disoriented after 3 to 4 monsoons ground water has got replenished but water channels have interspersed with salt water lines psychological damage hmm yes it has left us very anxious for 3 to 4 years every seismic jolt left us anxiously looking towards the sea in the april 2012 earthquake yes anxiety was writ large on our faces the patients in the rangat hospital also were affected by fear after the april 2012 earthquake the mud volcano in baratang erupt erupted on the day of the mega earthquake the mud volcano in diglipur is slowly invading more land in the neighborhood now we come to mr parameshwaran he is an executive engineer in the ongc in nagapatnam tamil nadu it was my birthday madam morning my fir- morning my first my son first kiss me and wish me happy birthday daddy then other daughter also came to wish me then the other daughter came then my son was playing with me on the bed he wished me and all other relatives who were visiting me from tharikere in chikmal Chikmagalur district in Karnataka also wished me for my birthday. The previous day we had all celebrated Christmas. All of us went to the beach around 7 a.m. and sometime between 7 and 8 a.m. we arrived at the beach which is only 500 meters from my home. The boys from amongst the relatives were playing on the beach. Some other boys from the town were playing, girls were exercising, people were walking, my two daughters were building castles on the beach. My relatives were seeing the ocean for the first time and were totally captivated. I was playing frisbee with my son. I threw the disc at him and he picked it up and he was facing the ocean. My back was to the ocean. He shouted, "Daddy, look at the sea." When I turned around to see the ocean, the ocean looked as high as a mountain. Immediately I told my son to run fast. We started running homeward, but the ocean caught up with us and were floating on the waves. By then my son was crying out, "Daddy!" I was holding him by then the second wave lifted up and dropped me down mercilessly on the beach I think then my son's hand lost his grip of my hand I don't know I don't remember how I lost my son's grip I was struggling to stay afloat too immediately I was thrown out by the ocean up to 750 meters inland I held on to the palm tree it scraped me I was injured you can see the scars on my elbow are still here as the water started receding I was drowning and could not breathe I was drowning in the water. I started climbing up the tree. Then I saw hundreds of people were struggling to be alive in the waves. As soon as the water receded, I started walking homeward in the water. My wife was standing on the balcony facing the ocean and calling out, shouting, "Where are you, my children?" She was desperately calling out the names of my children. I was nearing home I called out to her about uh, what about my mother she was 86 years old then my wife chudamani shouted back saying your mother is here what about the children my wife uh, without answering my wa- wife I started running towards the ocean as I neared the railway track which is only 200 meters from my house I saw my older daughter floating on the water she was dead I lifted my daughter she was already gone I carried her home and handed her to my to my wife I turned back and again to look for my other two children when i was nearing the ocean i again saw the bodies of my niece and her grandmother 17 year old niece and her grandmother with the help of my nephews i carried the two corpses back home an hour later a man came and told me that my son was lying near the tree near the collector's bungalow so i ran towards the tree and found my son under the tree like a stone statue i immediately knew he was dead i brought him home back sobbing i started running towards the ocean desperately but survivors started yelling at me not to run towards the ocean because a second wave is coming by then it was around 10 am i placed my son's body on the terrace of a neighbor's house and was running homeward when my wife called out if i had found someone i told her yes i found my son I placed my son's body on the terrace of a neighbor's house and was running homeward when 
when my wife called if I had found someone. I told her, yes, I found my son. She was emotional and shouted, thank you God for, you, for having found our son. I told her I found Krupasan all right, but he will not be able to speak to you because he is dead. Around 11 a.m. a man came to me and told me that my daughter was found hanging on a bush of a tree. When I went to take my daughter, I noticed that she was very brutally injured. Ai's face were injured by the thorns of the bush. I brought her back to brought her body back to our house. By then, the third wave had destroyed everything in my house. Uh, all furniture, utensils, car, things in the garage were all floating. Whole day, we kept searching for the rest of our relatives. Of the 11 of us who went to the beach, I was the only one who survived. We found seven bodies. By then it was 6.30 p.m. No power was there. We could not find a matchbox to light a candle. By 6.30 p.m. my wife asked us to bury the children because the bodies were, had started decomposing by then. I carried all the three children to the graveyard in the evening. My wife was braver than me. She suggested that we bury the children because decomposed set in. I asked my nephews to get some flowers to bury my children. I then took the bodies of my children for the burial. But no flowers were available in the city. There was no grave digger either. I dug the grave. I pit one pit for all three children. After digging the grave, I placed the children in the pit. We cried and begged my children for not doing the last rites. For, uh, for not doing the last rites of the children. We begged our children for forgiveness. We buried them and came back home. We will learn more about Parameshwaran and how he came to terms with the tragedy in chapter 10 called Heroes and Cowards of the Tsunami. Now we come to Miss Sonali Derani Yagala, a native of Sri Lanka, who lost her husband, two children and her parents to the tsunami when they were holidaying in Yala National Park in Sri Lanka. Her story is reproduced here from her Guardian web page and this link will be put up in the description box below. Sonali's life has been a struggle to overcome. Her book Wave has won her the Pen Ackerley Prize for 2014. The way she has overcome the tragedy is a tribute to humankind's struggle and psychological conflict. I have not had the fortune of meeting this lady, but reading her blogs and interviews and ref refreshes one's respect for human life at the very least. Sunil Shanta Sudhu Singha, employee at the rest house in Tangala, Sri, La Sri Lanka said, between 9.10 am and 9.15 am, four massive waves came and hit Tangala. The whole port area was smashed by the tsunami. I was working in the guest house. I was in charge of housekeeping and also double as a steward. The waves were inundating us from all directions. First wave was about eight feet high. Second wave was about higher than the street lights. The second, the sea withdrew about 500 meters from shore before the last wave hit land. The third and the fourth waves were about 75 feet in height. The fourth wave followed soon after. I ran to the Navy base at a higher elevation behind the rest house on a hill. There were not many guests in the rest house that day. All eight rooms on the ground floor were damaged by the tsunami. Only one room was occupied by tourists and they too ran to the third floor. The fishing boats slammed the buildings on dry land as they were lifted up by the waves. About 10 boats rested inside the rest house. A few went so far into the ocean that they were never retrieved. That day, there were over 200 boats in the harbour. Only one was left in the harbour, the others were all lost. On the other side of the bay, about 2,000 people died in the tsunami. The speed at which the waves hit land, they created whirlpools of debris float floating on what was once dry land. One ship that was anchored in Tangala was later found in Hambantota, about 67 kilometers away. Two trawlers were found inland. My family lives in Dikwela near Mathara. Since my house is on a hill on the, on the seaside, my house was not affected. Tangala was so damaged that we could not go outside. My family members came looking for me from Mathara, that is Dikwela. My brother who works in the Sri Lankan army came by bicycle to look for me. I lost everything except what uniform I was wearing. I went home for a after a couple of days in the uniform that I was wearing. Survivors were scared of eating fish for a whole month after that. There, wa there was general apprehension that fish would be eating the cadavers or deceased or those who died in the tsunami. So people refused to eat fish for a whole month. After the reconstruction of the guest house, I became the manager of the guest house without support from the government. Tamli de Soiza, Restaurantia Alutgama in Sri Lanka. No, we did not feel the earthquake. Minutes before the first wave hit us on the land side of the coastal highway, the sea started making a noise. 
Suddenly, the wave lashed us across the road. Despite the presence of huge rocks, boulders, and a coastal forest, we have pounded. Where the, the wave pounded on this side of the road. Walls collapsed. Seawater inundated us. Carmini Pereira, curator of the Tsunami Photo Museum in Telavatta. We ran inland for our lives, madam. The first wave was slow in coming. It took with, our, with it all the smashed debris from the land to the sea. The second wave was menacingly high and came with debris. The third wave was the killer. Only the third wave took many lives. We came back to our town only in the evening with fear on our faces. By then we saw thousands of dead bodies littering the landscape. Writing this book, indeed this chapter has been a redemption for my guilt on the day of the tsunami. As a trained journalist, I was unable to do anything to save lives on the day of the tsunami struck. That guilt has haunted me for years, I'm talking of myself now. So writing this book has been vastly therapeutic to me. Another purpose of writing this book is to share the struggle of this chapter at least is to share the struggle of the tsunami survivors. They struggled and battled with mother nature to survive. Their struggle to rebuild their lives and to come to terms with reality commends nothing but respect and awe. In fact, they offer an inspiration to others. Profiling, documenting and sharing their struggle is what this book seeks to achieve. And this chapter epitomizes this struggle in the words of the survivors themselves. Lessons to be learned include early warning should be foolproof. Evacuation infrastructure should be avant-garde. Mock drills and standard operation procedures should be a familiar thing for people living in calamity-prone areas. An electronic bulletin board or a missing people's registry should be done on social media. People should declare themselves or mark themselves as safe when calamities strike. That is all for tonight. I hope you found today's survivor's tales interesting. With this, we have completed ch reading chapter 9 on, su on survivor's tales of the tsunami. In the next week's book reading, we shall meet heroes of the Asian tsunami. There are a lot more of stories of survivors coming up there. Please do subscribe to our channel and share the videos in your circles and networks because we need your support and encouragement to start a web series on disaster risk reduction. Please don't forget to tune in to the live interaction around 7.30 p.m. on Saturday evening, 24th July 2021, Indian Standard Time. I do hope to catch you all during the live interaction. Until then, take care, keep smiling, stay home, stay safe. Ciao.